Everyone had high hopes for Benjamin after graduating third in his class with the highest SAT ranking of any student from the Detroit Public Schools in the last 20 years. He only had money to apply to one college, so he made it Yale, and he was accepted. He was feeling like hot stuff until the end of his first semester. He was failing chemistry. Everything came down to the final test, but he wasn't ready, not by a long shot. He prayed, God, all I've ever wanted to be is a doctor. Show me what you want me to be. His plan was to study all night, and then take the test, but sleep overcame him. All hope was lost. But then a dream came to him. In his dream, a nebulous figure was in an auditorium writing chemistry problems on a chalkboard. The next morning, he went to take the test. And he says it was like being in the twilight zone. First question, he remembered that that was in his dream. The second question, that was in his dream too. Third, and on it went, he aced the test and got a high mark in chemistry. And he was done. He said, God, you'll never have to do that for me again. But thank you. He went on to become a doctor. At age 33, he was the youngest uh, head of a pediatric neurosurgery department in the nation. He went on to do amazing miracles at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He was the first to separate uh, twins conjoined at the brain and the first to do a successful surgery on a fetus. Uh, he was uh, pioneered uh, doing uh, stem and spinal cord tumors. Uh, 2014, he received the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 2014, he was ranked among the top 10 most uh, uh, popular or uh, respected people in the United States. Benjamin Solomon Carson. So what do you think? Think this really happened? Or did he exaggerate it? Or was this a divine intervention by God? There's Barbara. She was diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis at Mayo Clinic. Her doctor, Dr. Harold Adolph, board-certified surgeon who performed 25,000 surgeries in the Chicago area, said she was the most ill patient he had ever had. Her internist, Dr. Thomas Marshall, doctor for 30 years, described her as a gal in high school that uh, was a budding gymnast. She was great on flute in the orchestra. But then her life began to fall apart. She began to trip and bump into walls. And it just kind of, it got worse from there. That's when she, the, her parents took her to Mayo Clinic and she was diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis. The next 16 years, her life went steadily downhill. One of her diaphragms didn't work at all. The other only worked half. So she was hospitalized many times for pneumonia. She went legally blind, couldn't read. She looked at people and they were like gray sh shapes. Uh, she lost her ability at urination, so they inserted a catheter into her bladder. Her stomach got grotesquely uh, expanded uh, because her intestine muscles didn't work. In 1981, she hadn't walked for seven years. She was pretty much uh, resigned to a bed where she was in kind of like a pretzel position. Her body was so deformed. Her muscles had tightened so much. Her hand was, or both hands were like twisted so they could touch her wrist. Her feet were uh, locked in the down position. Went to Mayo Clinic for her last hope and they said, you know, there's nothing more we can do for you. All you can do is pray for a miracle. Dr. Thomas Marshall said, you know, at this point, it's just a matter of time before she dies. And so she went into her home with hospice care. 
Word got to Moody Bible Institute radio station about Barbara, and so they put out the word for people to pray for Barbara. 450 letters came into her church, and on Pentecost Sunday, 1981, her aunt brought these letters into her hospital room and began to read them to her. People that said, we're praying for you. Two of her friends were there as well. During a lull in the conversation, Barbara heard a distinct male voice, though there was no man in the room, speak with authority and compassion, my child, get up and walk. Her friends could tell that she was agitated, so they put the plug in her throat so she could speak. And She says, you may not believe this, but God just told me to get up and walk. She says, quick, go get my parents. I want them here. And she felt compelled to do what she believed God had told her to do. She jumped out of bed. She took off her oxygen. And she was standing on legs that hadn't withstood her weight for eight years. Her mom fell down on her knees and felt her legs. She says, you've got muscles again. Her feet and her hands were free again to move. She could breathe freely for the first time in seven years. Her dad grabbed her in his arms and began to take her on a waltz through the family room. The next day, she went to see Dr. Marshall. And he said, seeing her walk down the hallway is like seeing an apparition. It was unbelievable. He said, what you have here is medically impossible. He says, all I can say to you is go live your life. She's gone on to live for 36 years. She married a pastor, took on a life of service to people, and she's had no recurrences of her illness. Both of her doctors have written in books and in articles about her, and Dr. Marshall wrote, I have never witnessed anything like this before or since and considered it a rare privilege to observe the hand of God performing a true miracle. So what do you think? Did she exaggerate this story? Did the doctors? Or was this God showing his supernatural power? Let me share one more with you. Jeff Markin, a 53-year-old auto mechanic, walked into the emergency room at Palm Beach Gardens Hospital in Boca Raton. He had a heart attack. For 45 minutes, they performed cardiac arrest treatment uh, with a defibrillator. Seven times they shocked him. Finally, the doctor, Dr. Chauncey Crandall, well-respected, Yale-educated cardiologist, taught in the medical school there, declared him dead at 8.05 p.m. He did the final paperwork, and he was turning to leave when he felt a compulsion to pray for Mr. Markin. He thought that was silly. So he tried to ignore it, but then he felt an even stronger compulsion. So he turned back, and the nurse was uh, removing the uh, uh, IV equipment and sponging him to get him ready for the morgue, and he prayed, God, if this man does not know you, would you raise him up again so he can be saved? And he told the emergency doctor to put the paddles on him and shock him one more time. That doctor thought it was crazy. He says, there's no use. I've, I've done it seven times. He's dead. But out of respect for his colleague, he did it. And Jeff Markin's heart began to beat normally, 75 beats per minute, immediately. Dr. Crandall says, I've never in all my practice seen any patient come back and have his heart beat normally, immediately. Well, the media got hold of this, and it became a big story in Florida. And um, one journalist said, well, maybe his heart never stopped. It was just kind of in a subtle rhythm for 45 minutes. Crandall says, that journalist is grasping at straws. Everybody who was there knew he was dead. And he came back to life. So what do you think? Is this another exaggeration? Or is this a divine intervention by God? This brings to mind the Apostle Paul's question, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? 
Should we be shocked that a supernatural God who created the universe should, can intervene in this world with supernatural power? It's pretty hard to maintain that supernatural does not happen today. Lee Strobel, in his book, Miracles, that came out this year, uh, commissioned George Barnett to do a survey. He asked, are miracles possible today? 60%, 67% of Americans said yes. 78% of evangelical Christians said yes. That would represent many uh, like us here today. In answer to the question, have you experienced a supernatural miracle in your life? 38% said yes. That would be 94 million Americans. 55% of doctors have seen results in their patients they consider miraculous. 75% of doctors are convinced miracles happen today. These are doctors who have built their practice on science. This explains why six out of 10 doctors pray for their patients individually. Is God still in the miracle business? Does he show his supernatural power today? This is the question we've been asking during this five-week series. Have you seen the supernatural power of God lately? Have you experienced God's supernatural power in your life? I've been hearing back from many of you throughout these last four weeks that you have experienced miracles does God still show his supernatural power in the world? Of course. Jesus said, whoever believes in me will do the works I do, and greater works than these shall they do because I'm going to my Father. Jesus teaches us that when he goes to his Father, he sends the Holy Spirit, and if we commit our lives to him, we have the Holy Spirit, the supernatural power of God in our lives, so we should expect to experience supernatural power. You can experience God's supernatural power in your life. Would you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5? If you want to use one of our Bibles uh, under the seats, it's on page 366. A man named Naaman, a great military commander in Syria, pays Elisha, the prophet, a visit. He was a highly decorated top general in uh, Syria, uh, the, the, the number two person in the government in Syria. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram, that's Syria. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Ancients were repulsed by leprosy. So the very fact that he was still in his job as the commander of the army means that the king saw him as so indispensable that he tolerated his leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria. Prophet is Elisha. Samaria is the capital of Israel. He would cure him of his leprosy. In one of his conquests, he picked up a Jewish girl as a slave. She knew Elisha the prophet and that he had God's power to heal. So she suggested to his wife, Naaman should go to him. Naaman went to his master and told him, this would be the king, told him what the girl from Israel had said. Just as people today will rush to Mexico or some other foreign country for a treatment that's not approved in the United States, he was looking for a miracle. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 cents of clothing. This would be the equivalent of $100,000 today. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. The king of Israel had rejected God. He, had, he no longer believed in the supernatural power of God like many of us today. He hadn't see, experienced God's supernatural power in his life, so he thought the king of Syria was just using this as a pretext to go to war against him. Elisha got wind of his visit. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Elisha was not impressed with this proud commander. He didn't even bother to go outside to, to say hello. But Naaman went away angry. 
and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. He was angry that Elisha didn't even come out to greet him. And he was further angry that he asked him to dunk in the Jordan. He considered the rivers in Damascus, I doubt if they really were, but he considered them superior. But God wanted him to do an act of faith, and it had to be in the Jordan River to show that it was the God of Israel healing him, not the false gods of Syria. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed, do some little thing? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan. I picture he went kicking and screaming, thinking this is so dumb. This will never work. He went down, he dunked once, he dunked twice, nothing happened. Dunked a third time, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. Came up the sixth time, he said, just like I thought, nothing's going to happen, this is so stupid. Then he dunked the seventh time. And as the man of God had told him, his flesh was restored, became clear like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. So what do we learn from this account about God's supernatural power and from the other accounts I've shared today? Two things. First, often God shows his supernatural power to draw people to faith. Jeff Markin, the man who died of a heart attack in, in Florida, did not know Christ. Naaman did not know God. Yet when Naaman was healed, he said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He wanted everybody to know about God. God is looking for people who will testify about his supernatural power. If God has healed you or shown, shown you supernatural power in your life, tell people. Don't be shy. By the way, we had a healing service last week and two people have told me that they were healed. Uh, I forgot to say at the time, if you're healed, uh, let me know. Uh, that, you know, healing often is, is signified by a kind of a burning sensation, the power of the Holy Spirit within you. So if something happened, would you let me know? Every doctor Jory consulted after she broke her back in Kenya 10 years ago, looked at her MRI and said, you should be paralyzed. I told you a couple weeks ago when her, car, when her car went hurling off a cliff, it was headed towards some huge trees and she knew that she was going to die. And so she cried out, Lord, save us. And God turned the car, she believes, and set it down in, you don't just move a car. Um, and uh, so she believed God did that and set her down in soft landing and spared her life. But the doctors also think he spared her of paralysis. So she has two miracles in one story. We tell people her story to whoever will listen. Healing is a powerful tool for reaching people for Christ. I've prayed for non-believers to be healed. Uh, to pray for somebody to be healed, if you, you have to know it's in God's will. And we don't always know that. But when somebody's not a believer, I think there's a pretty good chance God may want to heal to lead them to Christ. So I always cut them a deal. I says, if you're healed, will you put your faith in Christ The toughest group to penetrate in the world today is the Muslim community. 86% of Muslims in the Muslim-majority countries do not know another Christian. They don't know a Christian. 50% are illiterate. So how is God supposed to reach them? Well, one of the ways Christ has been reaching Muslims has been through dreams. Uh, many, many Muslims have come to faith through a dream, and, and, and the dream is usually the same. It's J Jesus coming to them, and he's in a white robe. And as a result of the dream, it's so vivid, <coughs> they get up and they go find a Christian. And they learn about Christ, and many of them become believers. 
Uh, many Muslims have also become believers through being healed or seeing healing happen. Muslims know that if they commit their lives to Christ, they're going to be ostracized. Uh, they're going to be rejected by their family. They could even be killed. So they are reticent to put their faith in Christ. But when they see healing happen, it's so overwhelming that many of them are willing to cross the line of faith. Same thing happens in other cultures and other faiths as well. 90% of the growth of the church in China is being fueled by healings. Especially true in the countryside where there are few medical facilities and many people are illiterate. Dr. Julie Ma at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies said the majority of the people in northern Philippines came to Christ through miraculous healings. In Ethiopia, more than 80% of believers surveyed in a Lutheran church attributed their conversions to healings and exorcisms. In Argentina, healing is by far the primary tool for reaching people for Christ. And many people have been healed, as I just shared with you earlier, in the States. Second, God always invites us to ask Him for healing, but we cannot presume if, when, and how He will heal. Elisha could have stepped out of his home and uh, touched Naaman, and he could have been healed immediately. That's what Naaman expected, but Elisha didn't do that. He didn't even come out. We get into the problems when we assume, when we pray for healing, that God has to do it at that moment in the way we prescribe. It's never a good idea for us to tell God what to do. We cannot always be certain what God's will is and how he will heal. But it's always right to ask for healing. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you. When you're with a friend or family member who's sick, lay hands on them and pray for God's healing. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. We have supernatural power. When our son Tad was 12, he had his tonsils removed, and he was in quite a bit of pain in his throat and his ears. Uh, he was given pain medicine, but that didn't seem to do it. And so we prayed for him, and then the pain went away. But it didn't just, it wasn't a one and done kind of prayer. Uh, we had to pray for him over and over again. So many times he would say, Mom, Dad, would you come and pray for me again? It's so painful. We'd pray again, and then he'd be relieved for a while. God was teaching us that sometimes he doesn't want us to, you know, just one prayer and it's done, but to have to depend on him hour by hour. We don't know if God's going to heal or how he's going to heal, but it's always right to ask. Say that with me. It's always right to ask. The reason we cannot presume when and how God will heal is because God knows in his wisdom how he will receive the most glory. Sometimes God heals us instantaneously and immediately. That's what Naaman expected. With instantaneous healings, God reaches down and immediately we're healed on the spot. But if we think that's the only way God works, we're dealing with an illusion. Sometimes God heals us gradually. That's more like what happened with Naaman. He had to go do something and then be healed. When God heals us gradually, sometimes he'll use doctors, their treatments, medicines. Maybe he'll help us find a counselor who can help us with an emotional trauma or maybe find the right pastor or um, Christian who can help us find relief from our guilt. Often God uses a combination of faith and medicine. Still other times God does not heal us but gives us the grace to deal with our illness. We cannot assume it's always God's will to heal. Obviously, it's not God's will to heal always because everybody dies. Sometimes it's God's will to leave us in our suffering. Jesus doesn't promise that we'll be free of suffering, but he promises to be with us, provide us the strength to get through. The Apostle Paul asked him to heal him of some affliction. God said no, but he gave him the grace to get through it. It's a dangerous thing to assume categorically that God wants everybody to be well. 
Sometimes God in his wisdom determines that he'll receive more glory by allowing a person to be sick and through their composure, their attitude, they can bring more people to Christ by being so amazed. You can experience God's supernatural power. God often uses his supernatural power to draw people to faith. So if you've experienced a miracle, share that with people. We cannot be sure, however, if and when and how God will heal. But the saddest scenario is to fail to experience God's supernatural power simply because we fail to ask. It's always God's will for us to ask. You know God has supernatural power. You know Christ has the power to heal. You know he loves you. So ask. Lord Jesus, thank you for your supernatural power that it is still available to us today like it was when you walked this earth. Forgive us for not asking, not looking for it more often, but we want to start. I want to give you a moment right now to pray. You're in need of something right now. My guess is most of us here need a miracle in some way. Well, go ahead and ask right now. Say, God, I need a miracle. Would you heal or whatever it is? But give him the room to move in the way he chooses. Maybe he will do it gradually, not instantly. Or maybe he won't do it at all, but he'll give you the strength to endure and the grace. You pray that way. If you've never given your life to Christ, ask him into your life right now and say, I want you and your supernatural power inside. You pray. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing our prayers and being a loving and powerful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.